Good afternoon, and it certainly feels weird to be up here without a mask, but we're going to do it. <laughs> so thanks for having me. So now that you know that your hips and your knees are infected, what are you going to do about it? There we go. No relevant disclosures here. So the problem is periprosthetic joint infection, number one cause of revision total knee, number two cause of revision total hip, and the incidence somewhere to one to three in your percent in your practice. So you are going to see this. Like we heard, don't bury your head in the sand. What are your options once it's diagnosed? You've got a couple things you can do. You can do a debridement with antibiotics and implant retention, also called an IND with component retention, a two-stage exchange, a one-stage exchange, suppression, if it's a susceptible organism, that's only suppression, maybe not even going to the operating room with a stable implant. This is a rare situation. Um, other very more unique situations are going to be resection completely, arthrodesis, amputation. These are going to be in history in cases with recalcitrant or resistant organisms, multiply infected cases, and medically people who can't even tolerate going to the operating room. So those are all the options. And we're going to specifically talk about IND with component retention. Why retention? It's less surgery, less morbidity. It could be life-saving for a patient if, there's, if they're really crashing in the ICU or in septic shock. This may be a way to debulk the, the burden of the infection and save their lives and quicker return to activity, potentially. For the physician, it's less time. Uh, it's certainly easier to open up the joint and then wash it out, sprinkle some antibiotics in there, uh, and then go home. Um, for society, economically, uh, if they can do this in one procedure, it's a little bit less uh, expensive, and then you can, patients can return to work uh, for a better outcome for themselves. So why retention? 87 patients here with revision total knees. These are patients that already had revision total knees with a lot of hardware in there, large stems, large cones, and you have options, right? You can IND it or you can take everything out. Doing a big tibial tubercle osteotomy, taking these things out can be very detrimental to the bone. You may not have any bone left, so you may think about just doing an IND in that particular situation because they do just as well. For out of Ortho Carolina here, 62% were successful in their DARE group and 67% in the two-stage group. So it's a bad problem regardless of what you do. So if you can make a bad problem a little bit less bad um, by doing just the DARE, that may be something you could consider. But INDs fail. They fail a lot. And the success rates are not good. So you have to pick specifically when you're going to do them. Multi-center study here, PGI within 90 days of the index surgery, 53% of them were TKAs. They had 56% failure rate in the first month, right? So half, basically 50-50. You know, imagine going up to your patient telling them, we've got a 50-50 chance that this is going to work. They're not going to really like that situation. 80% failure when the IND was within 10 days of surgery. Um, the timing thing we'll talk about in a few slides here. And the causative organism in this particular study was not associated with failure rate, but I think it actually, as we start bearing out the literature, it is important. Knowing what organism it is has a direct success on how successful you're going to be. This has been looked at many, many, many times by many centers, and it's a difficult problem to treat because there's so many confounding variables. Um, failure by organism. 150 patients with PGI treated with an IND, 69% failure rate requiring reoperation, 62% of them had the same organism, 24% had a new organism when they went back on the second time when they failed. So it's either they got a new infection or you either gave them so many antibiotics you killed all the bugs except something else. But they found that strep and staph had the highest Six, or lowest success rates, really bad organisms. So if you have infections with those very aggressive bacteria, this is somebody you may not want to consider doing INDs on. And what if your IND fails? Ortho Carolina group again, 83 total knees. They had a 34% that failed a subsequent two-stage exchange, and there's no difference if the IND was done within four weeks or after four weeks. So bad problem if you have an IND and then you go on to a two stage, you actually made the patient potentially worse doing their two stage after having tried an IND. So you really want to be selective about who you do your IND on. Does the chronicity matter? This is some unpublished data uh, from the HSS group, 250 patients that had DARE survivor rates or that two-year follow-up, and they ca categorized it by staph aureus and non-staph and then culture negative PJI, and they found that if you had an acute staph infection versus an acute non-staph infection, you had a five times odd ratio of failing. If you had a chronic staph versus a chronic other, same thing, five times odd ratio of failing. And if you had an acute hematogenous with staph, you had a seven times uh, odd ratio of failing. So just because you had staph there was the most important factor, and it wasn't necessarily the chronicity of the infection. Arthroscopic versus open. In the native knee, you can maybe get away with an arthroscopic IND, uh, but in a total knee, this is a, a pretty bad idea. It, it's close to 50-50 again, and, and maybe even worse, 38% successful. So don't try to do this through arthroscopically. This should be done through open techniques. 
So how do I make an IND successful? It's really going to be about patient selection and then adjuvant treatments. The Mayo Clinic did the contemporary analysis of this. This was in BJJ, 134 total knees with acute post-op infections. 20 of their patients died in the first two years, so this is a really bad problem. 45%, 45 patients died by the latest follow-up, which is a 10 years. That's, that's a lot, right? That's, this is a really bad, morbid problem. IND with poly exchange, if it's modular, plus four to six weeks of IV antibiotics, and then PO antibiotics for the life of the implant, right? The patient's still living, the implant's still in there, that's the life of the implant. So this is long-term chronic oral antibiotic suppression. Recurrent infections in 34% at a mean of 1.6 years, success in 66% at five years, right? So that's pretty consistent with all the other literature that we've seen. 58% of the time it was the same organism, only 9% had new organisms, and there was no resistance to the chronic PO antibiotics. So giving chronic PO antibiotics didn't like subselect some super bug that made these resistant to the next time that you treated them. Risk factors were staph species, hazard ratio is 3.6, antibiotic resistant organisms, and age less than 60. So if you see those things, you probably should not be doing a dare. Culture negative was actually a good thing in this particular series, and were really things that were irrelevant it was whether if it's a monoblock tibi or not, a host type, you know, whether it's coternally A, B, C, symptom duration, or BMI. Other things that can make your IND successful, this was a study that looked at sonicating the implants using scrub brushes and chlorhexidine, all these different adjuvants. This was done multiple years ago, and now we've come a little bit further in our understanding of this. But it's really the biofilm is what makes these infections fail, or, or your INDs fail. A biofilm forms on the implant within about 48 hours after, sir, after that infection begins. So you have an, only a time, short time window to get that IND done. And once the biofilm forms, it can form not only on your implant, but it can form on the tissues too. So we have to figure out a way to fight the biofilms, and that's where a lot of the research is. This was presented at AUKUS last year. They looked at a basic science model where they looked at titanium, cement, and plastic, or the PM, um, polyethylene. They got MSSA bacteria, and they did just the planktonic state, so no biofilms, and then they also studied this with biofilm formation. And they looked at the different irrigation solutions that we use in order to try to kill biofilm during surgery. They looked at saline, they did saline with Venco, polymyxin, bacitracin, which is a common favorite, different pavidone iodine situations, that's betadine, Iricep, Bactosure, and Protanson. So commercially available products, they looked at all these and how they affected biofilm on those materials. What they found was in a planktonic state, so this is a primary total knee replacement, before the bacteria has had a chance to make a biofilm, almost every irrigation solution was okay. Everything except only saline, everything except Vanco, and polymix and bacitracin. Right? If you used any of them, Iricep, Bactosur, any povidone iodine solution, you basically killed all the bacteria in that particular situation, whether you left it in for one minute or three minutes to soak. Right, that's the primary total knee state, and we should probably be doing this because prevention of infection is probably the number one key to treat infection, not have one. When you looked at the biofilm results, the results here were much different. Almost every single irrigation solution did not work against biofilm, except very high doses, very high concentrations of povidone iodine. So this isn't the dilute betadine that we talk about doing 17 and a half and 500. This is actually 10% povidone iodine solution, and even better than that, maybe povidone iodine 50-50 with peroxide. Um, they didn't study Dakin solution in that, but that's basically pure bleach, putting a bomb in there, and that also seems to work. So think about these things when you're doing your dares, doing adjuvant treatments. Chronic antibiotic suppression at five years, the antibiotic suppression group giving PO antibiotics, 68% survivor versus 41%, so definitely something you should consider. So in conclusion, IND with component retention is possible, but the failure rates are very high. You should be very selective about who you use them in. Try not to do them as staph species, antibiotic-resistant organisms, or age less than 60, because you don't want to put somebody less than 60 on chronic PO antibiotics. Use an IND solution. Make sure you use adjuvant treatments, IV antibiotics for six weeks, and then chronic antibiotic suppression. Thanks very much.